general term Greco-Roman philosophy or ancient philosophy encompasses several different periods of philosophy, of which Hellenistic philosophy is only one of them. So if we think about um, the first period from, from basically the 7th and 6th uh, centuries BC, this is a period we call um, Archaic Greece. Historians refer to it as Archaic Greece. And there are some things we call wisdom traditions and that relate to philosophy. And we actually get a sort of development of philosophical ideas in this period, although the term philosophy is not used in this period. So we can think of works by people like Homer and Hesiod, who wrote didactic, epic poems that were used for educational purposes throughout antiquity. We can think of those as a kind of wisdom tradition. And then there's you know, the seven sages and so forth. People like uh, Thales, politicians who also had scientific interests and developed a reputation for being wise. Uh, but we also get in this period the development of what we now call natural philosophy and a much more um, naturalistic approach to wisdom in general. Instead of it being about uh, figuring out what the gods want you to do or something, we start having an investigation of what nature is about. And we have several people that wrote works in this period, and they it's so early in the transition to prose writing that most of these works didn't even have titles of their own and were later just called um, On Nature. And that includes people like Anaximander, Parmenides, Empedocles, Democritus, and so forth. Now, by the way, you don't need to know those, you don't need to memorize those names, you don't even know how, need to know how to spell them. Um, and we, I, I will be referring back to some of them to talk about their influences on Hellenistic ethics. But the point is that there's, there's a bunch of people who influence later philosophy that don't, we don't, we don't really consider philosophers in their own way, for reasons that I'll get into later. Now, the classical period of Greek philosophy comes after this, in the, in the late 5th and the 4th century BC. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people started off basically with Socrates, um, and Socrates' various pupils, including people like Antisthenes, Aristippus, and Plato. Plato, in this era, founded a school and an institution of philosophy called the Academy, which is why we still use the term academics and so forth, named after the first institution of higher education, which was an institution designed specifically to teach uh, philosophy. Um, and pupil, uh, Plato's pupil Aristotle, who also later started his own school of philosophy, something of a rival to the academy, but for the first, uh, for, for about 20 years, he was actually a, a, a member of Plato's academy and a pupil of Plato. So we have this tight-knit succession of philosophers in the classic age, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and they basically define what we think of as the classical period of philosophy. Now, um, Aristotle lived from 384 to 322 BC. And one thing he did, one thing that he was famous for having done, was tutored this young guy named Alexander, who was not yet Alexander the Great, because he was just Alexander the like, punk kid or whatever at this point in time. Uh, but he was tutored by this famous pupil of Plato named Aristotle. After all of his adventures invading Asia and things like this, um, Alexander the Great died in 323. His teacher, at a, at a young age, in his 30s, his teacher, Aristotle, um, died a year later, unconnected with the events of Alexander's death. But historians uh, start, designate the Hellenistic period of ancient history as beginning with the death of Alexander, 
And so that, since Aristotle's death is basically at the same time, it's a convenient starting point for thinking about the beginning of Hellenistic philosophy. So Hellenistic philosophy is post-classical philosophy, after Socrates, Plato, and specifically after Aristotle. So in Hellenistic philosophy, we have figures like Diogenes of Sinop, uh, who we'll be reading. He was a cynical philosopher and started a kind of school of cynics. We have um, got Stoics, Cyrenaics, Epicureans, uh, various stripes of skeptical philosophers, including a later development within Plato's Academy where it took a very skeptical direction, and then a reaction to that skeptical direction in an even more radical direction of uh, Peronian skepticism, and lots of complex developments going in different uh, directions. Now, if you happen to have the evaluation form I gave you last time. On the back of it, there's something that's actually kind of useful, which is a timeline, which gives the um, dates and arranges into columns the classical age philosophers and then the main schools of Hellenistic philosophy. <laughs> Does, did, did, did anybody not get a copy of that and wants one, wants to have one uh, right now? Because I've got a couple of extras. Okay, a bunch of people. Um, so here's here's two. Hand one over to them, and then I'll give you one, and then you guys can look on together. All right. <clears throat> so we're looking at the very back of that document. And there's a timeline. And in the um, upper left corner is Socrates, the guy who kicked it all off. You know, the guy who drank the hemlock and he, he was so ugly and so annoying that they, they put in such an annoying philosopher that they put him to death, right? Um, <clears throat> two of his pupils across the top line include Antisthenes, who was a sort of proto-cynic philosopher who embraced a way of life of poverty, threw all his money away, wore rags and so forth, and encouraged us to be tough and not care about material things and so forth. He then influenced the development of the cynical school figures like Diogenes of Sinope, and they eventually influenced the founder of the school of Stoicism, which then was a, a continuous uh, school through all periods of later Greek history and Roman history. Um, a, a, another pupil of Socrates named Aristippus was had a kind of opposite philosophy and, of Antisthenes. He was a crude hedonist. He thought that the whole point of life was just you know sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and that all the stuff about virtue and embracing the life of poverty and so forth was ridiculous. And so he started off this ethical idea that you should devote your life to pleasure. Um, he had an influence on, although the details of his views are totally rejected and reworked by another school that adopted a, uh, a, 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 a hedonistic orientation, and that is the Garden of Epicurus. And so all of the people in that last column um, are later figures within the school of Epicureanism. Yeah, question. Uh, why is Diogenes considered Hellenistic if he was alive at the same time as Plato? Well, um, essentially because his writing, and, and Aristotle, um, I mean, he, uh, he, he didn't even outlive Aristotle. So um, the thing is, is that it's, it's less of a strict chronological distinction, and it's more about where his influence and ideas resonated. So they had no resonance whatsoever among any of the classical texts that we have from the period, but had enormous importance and resonance in the Hellenistic era. But you know, in a way, technically, he isn't a Hellenistic philosopher. But we have to read him to understand the developments that happen in, in Hellenistic philosophy. But you know, chronologically, he's a, he's a classical age philosopher. Since none of his writings survive, we don't 
we have to depend on Hellenistic writers also that wrote about him in order to know anything about him. Whereas for Plato and Aristotle, we have enormous corpuses of their, of their writings. Um, <clears throat> the, the first two columns show the development of these schools of Plato and Aristotle, the academy and the school of Aristotle, which in the Hellenistic age became known as the Peripatos, um, or the Lyceum. Again, there's no importance of memorizing these, these names or these dates, and you could have access to this document anytime I was asking you about these things. But the, the main thing I want to show is just how long there was a continuous period of development of these schools. I mean, this, isn't, this document is not to scale, and it ends in about 180 uh, AD with Marcus Aurelius, but, you know, that's... Um, that's about 500 years after the thing begins. So the, the period that we're discussing is about a four or 500 period um, year period of philosophy. So that's another thing is about these, these divisions into archaic, classical, Hellenistic, and so forth are not equal divisions. They're more thematic about what kind of unities of, of texts and ideas and schools and so forth. Um, but, you know, the uh, Plato's Academy, which was founded during his lifetime, um, survived as an institution, as an actual institution, for more than 500 years, before it was closed by the Emperor Justinian, who was um, persecuting pagan philosophers. Um, now think about that. So this university has been around for 50 years. Okay, so take take another you know order of magnitude. 500 years is how long that institution was around for. And in a way, it it has been revived, and the ideas and so forth of it kept going. But we're talking about long periods of development. So even even within these schools, even though they have thematic unity and argumentative and textual unities of various kinds, they also change and develop uh, over time, as one would expect. 